Abiogenesis. This sound file contains the spoken version of a Wikipedia article on Abiogenesis. You are listening to the second part. The second part begins now. Abiogenesis. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. Section 1. Fundamental Concepts Three major macromolecules are essential for all known forms of life. The first is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. DNA is the main component of chromosomes and the material that transfers genetic characteristics in all life forms. DNA is an extremely long macromolecule that is constructed of two nucleotide strands coiled around each other in a ladder-like arrangement, with the side pieces composed of alternating phosphate and deoxyribose units, and the rungs composed of the bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The genetic information of DNA is encoded in the sequence of the bases and is transcribed as the strands unwind and replicate. The second major macromolecule essential for all known forms of life is RNA. Ribonucleic acid, or RNA, are single-stranded molecules transcribed from DNA containing along the strand a linear sequence of nucleotide bases that is complementary to the DNA strand from which it is transcribed. The composition of the RNA molecule is identical with that of DNA, except for the substitution of the sugar ribose for deoxyribose and the substitution of the nucleotide base uracil for thymine. The third major macromolecule essential for all known forms of life are proteins. Proteins are highly varied organic molecules constituting a large portion of the mass of every life form and necessary in the diet of all animals and other non-photosynthesizing organisms. Proteins are composed of 20 or more amino acids linked in a genetically controlled linear sequence into one or more long polypeptide chains. Polypeptides are made of single linked peptides. Most amino acids, building blocks from which proteins are constructed, and often called the, quote, building blocks of life, end quote, can form via natural chemical reactions unrelated to life. Other equally fundamental biochemicals that, when joined together, make up the structural units of RNA and DNA, can arise in similar ways. In all living things, these biochemicals are organized into more complex molecules, including macromolecules such as proteins and nucleic acids DNA or RNA. The construction of these macromolecules mediated by these nucleic acids and enzymes that are themselves synthesized through biochemical pathways, catalyzed, accelerated its chemical change, largely by proteins. Which of these various classes of organic molecules first arose, and how they formed the first life, is a major topic in the discipline of abiogenesis. The first living things on Earth are thought to be single-cell prokaryotes, which, like a cell nucleus, perhaps evolved from protobionts, organic molecules surrounded by a membrane-like structure. The oldest ancient fossil microbe-like objects are dated to be 3.5 billion years old, approximately 1 billion years after the formation of the Earth itself with reliable fossil evidence of the first life found in rocks 3.4 billion years ago. Isotopes are any of two or more forms of a chemical element having the same number of protons in the nucleus, or the same atomic number, but having different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus, or different atomic weights. By 2.4 billion years ago, 
the ratio of stable isotopes of carbon, iron, and sulfur shows the action of living things on inorganic minerals and sediments, and sediments and molecular biomarkers indicate photosynthesis, demonstrating that life on Earth was widespread by this time. The sequence of chemical events that led to the first nucleic acids is not known. Several hypotheses about early life have been proposed, most notably the iron-sulfur world theory, metabolism without genetics, and the RNA world hypothesis, RNA life forms. Section 2. Conceptual History Spontaneous Generation Until the early 19th century, people generally believed in the ongoing, spontaneous generation of certain forms of life from non-living matter. This was paired with the belief in heterogenesis, that is, that one form of life derived from a different form, for example, bees from flowers. Classical notions of abiogenesis, now more precisely known as spontaneous generation, held that certain complex living organisms are generated by decaying organic substances. According to Aristotle, it was a readily observable truth that aphids arose from the dew that fall on plants, flies from putrid matter, mice from dirty hay, crocodiles from rotting logs at the bottom of bodies of water, and so on. In the 17th century, such assumptions started to be questioned. For example, in 1646, Sir Thomas Brown published his Pseudodoxia Epidemica, subtitled Inquiries into Very Many Received Tenets and Commonly Presumed Truths, which was an attack on false beliefs and, quote, vulgar errors, end quote. His conclusions were not widely accepted. For example, his contemporary Alexander Ross wrote, quote, To question this, spontaneous generation, is to question reason, sense, and experience. If he doubts of this, let him go to Egypt, and there he will find the fields swarming with mice begot of the mud of Nilus, to the great calamity of the inhabitants, end quote. In 1665, Robert Hooke published the first drawings of a microorganism. Hooke was followed in 1676 by Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who drew and described microorganisms that are now thought to have been protozoa and bacteria. Many felt that the existence of microorganisms was evidence in support of spontaneous generation, since microorganisms seemed too simplistic for sexual reproduction, and asexual reproduction through cell division had not yet been observed. The first solid evidence against spontaneous generation came in 1668 from Francesco Redi, who proved that no maggots appeared in meat when flies were prevented from laying eggs. The previous sentiment regarding spontaneous generation was false. The alternative seemed to be biogenesis, that every living thing came from a pre-existing living thing. Omne vivum ex ovo, Latin for every living thing from an egg. In 1768, Lazaro Spallanzani demonstrated that microbes were present in the air and could be killed by boiling. Louis Pasteur performed a series of experiments which demonstrated that organisms, such as bacteria and fungi, do not spontaneously appear in sterile, nutrient-rich media. Pasteur and Darwin By the middle of the 19th century, the theory of biogenesis had accumulated so much evidential support due to the work of Louis Pasteur and others that the alternative theory of spontaneous generation had been effectively disproven. Pasteur himself remarked after a definitive finding in 1864, quote, 
Never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow struck by this simple experiment. End quote. In a letter to Joseph Dalton Hooker on February 1, 1871, Charles Darwin addressed the question, suggesting that the original spark of life may have begun in a, quote, warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., present, so that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, end quote. He went on to explain that, quote, at the present day, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. In other words, the presence of life itself makes the search for the origin of life dependent on the sterile conditions of the laboratory. Primordial Soup Theory no new notable research or theory on the subject appeared until 1924, when Alexander Operin reasoned that atmospheric oxygen prevents the synthesis of certain inorganic compounds that are necessary building blocks for the evolution of life. In his The Origin of Life, Operin proposed that the, quote, spontaneous generation of life, end quote, that had been attacked by Louis Pasteur did in fact occur once, but was now impossible because the conditions found on the early earth had changed and pre-existing organisms would immediately consume any spontaneously generated organism. Operin argued that a, quote, primeval soup, end quote, of organic molecules could be created in an oxygenless atmosphere through the action of sunlight. These would combine in ever more complex ways until they formed coacervate droplets. These droplets would, quote, grow, end quote, by fusion with other droplets and, quote, reproduce, end quote, through fission into daughter droplets, and so have a primitive metabolism in which those factors which promote Quote, cell integrity, end quote, survive, and those that do not become extinct. Many modern theories of the origin of life still take Operin's ideas as a starting point. Around the same time, J.B.S. Haldane suggested that the Earth's prebiotic oceans, different from their modern counterparts, would have formed a, quote, hot dilute soup, End quote, in which organic compounds could have formed, the process of living matter evolving from self-replicating but non-living molecules. In 1952, in the Miller-Urey experiment, a mixture of water, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia was cycled through an apparatus that delivered electrical sparks to the mixture. After one week, it was found that about 10% to 15% of the carbon in the system was now in the form of organic compounds, including amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. The underlying hypothesis held by Operin and Haldane was that conditions on the primeval earth favored chemical reactions that synthesized organic compounds from inorganic precursors. A recent reanalysis of the saved vials containing the original extracts that resulted in the Miller and Urey experiments has uncovered more biochemicals than originally discovered in the 1950s. One of the more important findings was 23 amino acids, far more than the five originally discovered. Section 3 Early conditions. Oceans and continental crust existed within 150 million years of Earth's formation, appearing first in the Hadean Eon. Despite this, the Hadean environment was one highly hazardous to life. 
frequent collisions with large objects up to 500 kilometers, or 310 miles in diameter, would have been sufficient to vaporize the ocean within a few months of impact with hot steam mixed with rock vapor leading to high-altitude clouds completely covering the planet. After a few months, the height of these clouds would have begun to decrease, but the cloud base would still have been elevated for about the next thousand years. After that, it would have begun to rain at low altitude. For another two thousand years, rains would slowly have drawn down the height of the clouds, returning the oceans to their original depths only three thousand years after the impact event. Between 3.8 and 4.1 billion years ago, changes in the orbits of the gaseous giant planets may have caused a late heavy bombardment that pockmarked the moon and other inner planets, Mercury, Mars, and presumably Earth and Venus. This would likely have sterilized the planet had life appeared before that time. By examining the time interval between such devastating environmental events, the time interval when life might first have come into existence can be found for different early environments. A study shows that if the deep marine hydrothermal setting provides a suitable site for the origin of life, abiogenesis could have appeared as early as 4.0 to 4.2 billion years ago, whereas if it occurred at the surface of the Earth, abiogenesis could only have occurred between 3.7 and 4.0 billion years ago. Other research suggests a colder start to life. Work by Leslie Argel and colleagues on the synthesis of purines fundamental constituents of nucleic acids, has shown that freezing temperatures are advantageous due to the concentrating effect for key precursors such as hydrogen cyanide. Research by Stanley Miller and colleagues suggested a beginning of life involving freezing conditions and exploding meteorites indicating the formation of seven different amino acids and eleven types of nucleobases in ice after ammonia and cyanide were left in a freezer from 1972 to 1997. This study also describes research by Christoph Weibrecher showing the formation of RNA molecules 400 bases long under freezing conditions using an RNA template, a single-strand chain of RNA that guides the formation of a new strand of DNA. As that new RNA strand grows, it adheres to the template. The explanation given for the unusual speed of these reactions at such a low temperature is eutectic freezing. As an ice crystal forms, it stays pure. Only molecules of water join the growing crystal, while impurities, like salt or cyanide, are excluded. These impurities become crowded in microscopic pockets of liquid within the ice, and this crowding causes the molecules to collide more often. Evidence of the early appearance of life comes from the Isua supercrustal belts in western Greenland, and from similar formations in the nearby Achelia Islands. Carbon, entering into rock formations, leaves isotopic fingerprints that are preserved in the sediments, and suggest that life existed on the planet already by 3.85 billion years ago. Lascano and Miller in 1994, suggested that the rapidity of the evolution of life is dictated by the rate of recirculating water through mid-ocean submarine vents. Complete recirculation takes 10 million years. Thus, any organic compounds produced by them 
would be altered or destroyed by temperatures exceeding 300 degrees Celsius or 572 degrees Fahrenheit. They estimate that the development of a 100 kilobase genome of a DNA slash protein primitive heterotroph into a 7,000 gene filamentous cyanobacterium would have required only 7 million years. The Nobel Prize winning chemist Christian de Duvet argues that the determination of chemistry means that, quote, life has to emerge quickly. Chemical reactions happen quickly or not at all. If any reaction takes a millennium to complete, then the chances are all the regions will simply dissipate or break down in the meantime, unless they are replenished by other faster reactions, end quote. We now come to the end of the spoken article, Abiogenesis, Part 2. The next part of the recording, Part 3, contains Section 4, Current Models. This sound file, its text, and all the text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported license available at http colon slash slash creative commons dot org slash licenses slash by hyphen sa slash three point zero.